Hello everyone, welcome to Voices of the Vessel. I'm Shelby, the Director of Marketing for the Badger, the Lake Michigan Car Ferry. This podcast is dedicated to highlighting the people and voices from over the years who have made the Badger what she is today, as she is celebrating 70 years of service. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Pier Ludington and Visit Manitowoc, our wonderful port cities. I am really excited for today's episode, and this is something I've been thinking about since we started this series and it has been a work in progress in all the best ways that I'm really excited to have with us, Art Chavez, for today's episode. Um, he's written some books about the Badger, the car ferries in, his, in general, and is kind of the historian in a lot of car ferry facts. He's taught me a lot about the Badger and just car ferries and as a whole. So I'm proud to call him a friend and colleague in this and just really excited to have him today. So Art, thank you for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Of course. And I think it's really cool, just like everything that you've done, you know, beyond just authoring books too. Like you've done some really neat things. And what got you interested in the car ferries in the first place? And how old were you? I was 10 years old when I first saw lights on the lake. I didn't know it was the Badger or Spartan, but it was one of the two. My aunt, who took me and my uh, family down to the lakefront in Milwaukee, thought that was the Milwaukee Clipper, which had been uh, retired two years prior. Oh, interesting. But she said it was a car ferry, so she was right on that in that regard. (laughs) Well, that's good. (laughs) Yeah, and and then the next year, I, I later that year, I saw it as a dotted line on the map too of Lake Michigan. Very cool. And uh, but I did see it uh, in 1974, the next year uh, when I was 11 years old. And it was a badger. Oh, how neat! So she's kind of like one of the first ones you got to see. It was the very first ship I ever car ferry ever saw with the badger. Yep. How neat! And so, what was like your first memory? Like, how old were you when you actually sailed on the badger for the or the car ferries for the first time? Uh, that was in 1975, so I was uh, 12 years old at the time. I went on the Midland. Uh, actually, the Spartan was uh, took me to Ludington, went with my father. We wandered around Ludington during the layover. It was probably four or five hours, walked around town, watched a movie. And then um, on the way back, we took the city of Midland. And the Midland is a completely different ship, and it was just a real treat to be on. That's so I cool. You kind remember. of got both, like, kind of like the new and the I I did. old at that time. But you got to experience both of them in one trip. I bet that would have been a really neat experience. It was. It was. And I remember it to this day like it was yesterday. It's fantastic. That's awesome. That is so cool. And so do you know approximately how many times you've sailed across on the car ferries over the years? I really don't. I, I, I couldn't even tell you. Over a hundred times, but it, yeah, it, I was going to say it has to be so, at least triple digits. Yeah, it was so natural to me. Um, it was like a second home to me uh, going aboard the ships, That's and the people awesome. were so accommodating, very very nice to me. So it was like a family type of uh, situation. That's cool, and I mean, just to have that home away from home and be able to have was. that that space, but they got to enjoy it with a multitude of of people and create lifelong friendships along the way. Oh, yes. Tremendous. Yeah. That's amazing. You just can't imagine a a young kid uh, growing up on the south side of Milwaukee, working class neighborhood, and Mm -hmm. suddenly befriending all these people from a different state. To me, it was almost like a different country. And it was just such a wonderful feeling (laughs) to to actually come into the Ludington Harbor and, and see this beautiful small port especially when you're living in a big dirty city where a lot Mm -hmm. there's there's interest in ships but because it's such a large city there's not the intense interest like Ludington or Manitowoc or Kiwan. True. Well and I have to laugh a little bit of I mean I'm very proud to be from Ludington and call Ludington my hometown but it's like I Wisconsin really has my heart. I love you know, getting to go to Wisconsin often and experience so many different facets of it. But I can almost say it's like a different country as well of just like the differences. And um, I wouldn't say Milwaukee is a big, dirty city, but 
at the same time like <laughs> it's industrial there's lots of things going on and just but yeah it's very different from Ludington yeah. for example well, at, at the Jones Island dock people are greeted by being located right next to the sewage plant so on a yeah. hot summer day you get that stench <laughs> And it flies all around. It was just nasty. <laughs> and, you know, like, random question in that. One thing that I had been told, and I don't know how true this is, is that when Wisconsin was formed as a state, so much emphasis was put on the farmland and that they didn't really emphasize a lot of the waterways. And so that's why a lot of industrial, like when you look at how Manitowoc and Milwaukee were made, that. Do you know if there's any truth to that? Like, because when you look at the ports on the Wisconsin side are so different from the Michigan side. They are, but the reason why they were um, situated in the where they are is because of the waters. Mm -hmm. The confluence of the Milwaukee, Kinnikinnick, and Menominee Rivers, yeah. which is why, why Indian villages were settled there. And then eventually when um, it was settled by uh, the American progression to the west and chicago too i mean yeah. the lakes were a big part of uh the reason for settlement of the area oh which makes perfect sense yeah and i know that farmland in wisconsin is pretty iconic oh, but, in its own way too absolutely up north maybe it might be a little bit different mm -hmm. a lot more um relevant and because there are smaller towns maybe the agriculture industry is far more um uh pervasive up there than it is yeah. but the going back to your point though too if i mean you had to have the waterway to ship these farm goods to places exactly though. yep yeah and what a what a big part of great lakes maritime history in and of itself yep so. yep grain so, from from the prairies were uh, uh transported on lake freighters uh package freighters eventually the car ferries destined to the east coast and beyond even to england and the rest of europe oh for sure i mean it's so vital especially when you just think about yeah how like geography and stuff that yes what is yeah i i like thinking about those things but maybe that's just me <laughs> <laughs> but what would you say you enjoy most about the car ferries oh for sure it's the people i mean the voyage is yeah. nice um but just getting to know th these unique individuals as as friends yeah almost like family you just uh i just can't describe how important that was to my upbringing that's that's so cool and i know that you and i had talked about it um before of just like i feel that the badger has you know this power to like connect people and moments and time and everything but i'm so glad you know the Badgers brought people like you into my life and so many Likewise, others. Likewise, I appreciate and, that as well, yes. It is just that but, is true. It does bring a lot of people together. I mean, yeah, physically we bring people together, but really, like, how often now in today's day and age that you have the opportunity to, like, actually sit down with someone and have that four-hour, like, uninterrupted time with someone. <laughs> You know, very true. Very it's true. Very fun. You got a captive audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, captive, literally. <laughs> No, I would say people make it a big um, thing for me as well. And what is something you wish more people knew or understood about the car ferries? Because, you know, they're not the everyday kind of ship. They are not. I just wish a lot of people realized they were even in existence. A lot of people still think they oh, don't true. exist. Yeah. I heard a lot of people say, oh, the ferry's still around? Really? <laughs> I thought it. I thought it shut down years ago. Oh, goodness. And I explained to them that it doesn't carry railroad cars like it used to be, and it's not mm -hmm. as dirty and sooty, you know, as a railroad freight boat that it was yeah. then. I mean, if they would go aboard the ship now, if they went aboard 30, 40 years ago, they would be amazed. It's just a, a completely different uh, operation and just more mm -hmm. suited to the passenger in mind. Yeah. Well, it's funny, too, like a lot of times when people say like, oh, I've been on the Mackinac Island Ferry or the Washington Island Ferry. <laughs> and, you know, that ride might only be 20, 40 minutes, depending on the day that people are like, what, four hours? And then <laughs> also of like, I hear it a lot of like, what, you can take a semi or a motor coach on a boat? Like, they just have no idea of 
the history or what she could do that I appreciate you helping get the word out that we are still very much in service and have a bright future ahead of us. <laughs> and yeah, it's um, just fascinating to think about that. But when did you really start researching the car fairies? Probably um, I was in junior high school when I started collecting newspaper clippings. Actually, I had a, uh, a subscription to the Ludington Daily News when I was um, probably in uh, late junior, maybe entering high school. In the, oh, really? Yeah. In fact, I, I got to know Captain or Captain Bissell's son, Dan. Mm, I got yeah. to know him. Through He's a, a great guy. He is. I wrote a, a little... Um, newspaper uh uh column not a column what do they call it a classified ad looking yeah. for pen pals <laughs> oh how fun interested he in would conference. be a great pen pal and he was <laughs> but how what a cool story of like you know and i don't know if pen pals are quite what they used to be but what a fun like innocent thing to do and just a cool way to meet people i love I that idea of- a couple other people uh, responded, but one was an older woman from Indiana who loved the Midland, and she oh. thought I was, she thought I was her age. She thought I was a retiree, and oh. I, was, I was twelve years old. Years <laughs> oh goodness! Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and then a few other people. They weren't as serious as Dan Bissell was, yeah. but I would say Dan Bissell of all the people that responded, he was the one who who lasted throughout um, my lifetime of interest in the car ferries. So yeah. That's, and I mean, and Dan is about your age as well. That yeah, talk about like a lifetime friendship meeting as a pen pal through the newspaper. Yes. <laughs> well, especially like, and I mean, being that I'm from Ludington, and I mean, I I love the Ludington Daily News, but um, did the Milwaukee newspapers did they have a lot of like car ferry type things, or was that more like was there more car ferry things in the, the Ludington Daily News? Oh, there was far more coverage in the Ludington Daily News, but there were like um, photographs of interest, like the Badger coming into the harbor or the Spartan leaving, the Midland leaving. Oh, Just yeah. A picture along the lake shore and a little sentence underneath saying that the car ferry is heading out and heading to Ludington, Michigan, things like that. The real coverage in the Milwaukee newspapers when the abandonment was underway. When oh, the railroad mm-hmm. was trying to abandon the service. Then it made lots of headlines yeah. in the TV news. But think about the like. I think that's a cool way to like just talk about like your dedication and the testament to like what the car ferries really meant to you. That you would have the Ludington Daily News sent to you in Milwaukee. Yes, I think- and I look forward to the mail coming every couple of days. <laughs> paper I think we might need to get that t- testimonial over to the Ludington Daily News. <laughs> I love that. That is neat. And so I know you kind of started, um, you know, researching the car fairies at kind of a young age. When did you decide that you'd like to write a book about the car fairies? Mm, That's a good one. Uh, Because of my uh, interest in the Ludington Daily News and the Milwaukee newspapers, I wrote to the editorial staff um, of both papers. Paul Peterson answered. Oh, yeah. I asked, are you? Are you thinking about writing a book about the car ferries, the abandonment? It's a fascinating story. Yeah. Both newspapers responded. They said, we've talked about it, but right now we've got a lot of other things going on. Mm-hmm. And then I even wrote a, um, another letter to a gentleman who wrote a fantastic um, historical narrative, like a scenario of the Edmund Fitzgerald sinking. Oh, wow. His name was, uh, his name was Robert Hemming from Ohio. His book was called Gales in November, and I wrote him a letter asking if he'd write a book on the car phrase but i never got a response there mm-hmm. but after that then i thought well i might as well just start uh saving information that hopefully one day i'll be able to write articles and uh do my own books and that eventually started happening so yeah and do you so how many books have you written and do you have an idea of how many articles you've written oh i've probably written probably 40 articles in magazines wow. and papers interviewed on radio and TV mm-hmm. on that deep sea detectives too. Uh, and yes. I want to talk more about that too. <laughs> I don't want to lose your train of thought though. No, no, I do and and, and then the that. four, the, the four pictorial history books 
mm -hmm. uh, from Arcadia Publishing. Those are nice. But I've been yeah. also working for the last 30 plus years on a all comprehensive history book on the late Michigan car ferries. Well, I'm so, excited to see that come together. Oh, a lot of people are. It's kind of a joke. Like, will he ever get it done? It's my, I call it my, <laughs> I call it my 30 year joke. <laughs> well, you know, I'll buy a copy first thing. So I already sold one of them, but That's Hey, cool. what is it? What's the saying that all good things come in, in due time. Yep, exactly. No sense of brushing it. Yep. But how did this come to be with the episode of the deep sea detectives? Um, the Deep Sea Detectives story came up in a series of three, two or three Great Lakes regional stories that the mm -hmm. Deep Sea Detectives crew was doing on the Great Lakes. And they contacted Brendan Baylot, who was the, uh, he is the gatekeeper of all um, shipwreck historical <laughs> data on the Great Lakes. Wow. And, uh, Brendan Baylod uh, knew my interest in the car ferries and my research. And when he heard there were gonna, the deep sea detectives was going to do a episode on the Milwaukee sinking Grand Trunk car ferry that sank yeah. in 1929, um, he decided Art would be the perfect guy to contact. And mm -hmm. they did contact me. And eventually, they that almost an entire episode was based on my research of the Milwaukee disaster. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah it was really neat. What? year did that episode film it filmed in 2005 and it was released hmm. early in 2006 wow. and then the year prior i think in 2005 i wrote a, a paper about the development of the seagates on the great lakes car ferries. yes and i won a writing award uh, from the association for great lakes maritime history that so that played so a, cool that played it thank you that played a big part in my um uh contribution to the uh, mm -hmm. episode on the Milwaukee sinking. And that's well, still around. You can find it on uh, online. So, yeah, so. And I've um, have watched most of the episode. And it's so fascinating because it, it's like, first of all, because I know you. And, mm -hmm. I was um, real young. That was almost 20 years ago. <laughs> well, it is just cool. I had a full like, head of hair. My hair was blacker. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is like, and some of the people, when they're like talking about because the Badgers, part of it of, I know some people in there and it's like, yeah, they also had hair, but it was also like they showed parts of the ship where it's like, that has not changed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was just very neat. But I think what's cool too, and talk about this of, and please correct me if I'm wrong in saying this, but you basically discovered a missing artifact from the preserve of the Milwaukee. I did. I did. Yes. Um, in 1962, George Hilton, who was the, the grandfather of car ferry history, mm -hmm. he's dead now, but I did get to uh, meet him and talk to him on the phone when he was in his uh, retirement community. Wow. He's kind of a mentor of mine. So yeah. that was a highlight of my <laughs> car ferry life, knowing him. But uh, he wrote about the existence of that uh, note written by the purser on mm -hmm. Milwaukee when it was sinking. And that was in 1962. So <clears throat> probably in the mid 1970s, I realized that this existed. And yeah. I always wondered whatever happened to that document. And I've been going to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., either directly or uh, writing, you know, by correspondence. Mm -hmm. And then I learned there was a, a Chicago Regional National Archives Division in Chicago. Oh, and interesting. And I, I was told by, by the Washington National Archives that the Milwaukee Rec Report was destroyed in a fire in St. Louis in, I think, in 1973 or so. Oh, and I believed it was lost. So yeah. I discovered that there was a, a court document testimony of the Milwaukee disaster. And I went to the archives in Chicago mm -hmm. and requested that file. And I'm going through the file and... I'm flipping through these dusty pages that hadn't been opened since 1931. Wow. Whenever, the, whenever, whenever the hearings ended, that was when it was tucked away and, and put in the drawer and smelled musty. How crazy. As I'm through these yellowed papers, <laughs> there is that note from Richard Sade, and it's, it's very faded. You can see it was mm -hmm. wet. 
got stains on it. And the National Archives people didn't even know it was there. And they were surprised. They wrote a little article about it and took pictures. Yeah. Yeah. How crazy is that? Just like the analogy that comes to mind right away is just an archaeological dig. It, of that's like, how it felt. It did feel yeah. like <laughs> it, It's just like how crazy that you got to unearth a piece of history. Oh, yes. And, but it was like, but what a great lesson in perseverance and just kind of like there has to be something out there. Like got to, you know, leave no stone unturned, but also a great lesson of why we should print our pictures, why we should take notes, you know, why we should have these things, like these things are worth, yes. I mean, they're history. And they are history. Keeping, and you should write on alive. the back of your photograph, right? <laughs> yes. Who the person is and the date. The year. Yeah, I was going to say the year, uh, the date. <laughs> oh, yeah. the name of the ship. What ship are you on? Yes. Yeah. Well, not, I mean, how many times now have I sent you a photo and be like, hi, can you help me figure out who this person is? <laughs> yep, that's true. Or this thing, for sure. And that is, wow. I mean, and I think it was cool. Like, I've known you now for how long? And I didn't know any of this about you until recently. And that is so cool. And, you know, I'm all about keeping history alive, but good on you for really, yeah, I appreciate you know, that. keeping and just... <laughs> What? And the people at the National Archives gave me a pair of uh, gloves, and they let me actually handle the documents. Wow! I, it, it was it was sealed. It was sealed in a, like a like a glass scene um, preserve. It looked like whenever it was tucked away, it was it was, it was in an envelope, but it wasn't oh. a, a archival quality envelope. Oh, okay. So yeah. When I pulled it out, I looked at it, but I didn't take it out of the sleeve. So I didn't touch it physically yeah. until he saw it. Then he pulled it out. I I paid a secondary visit and then they gave me gloves and he said, you can actually hold it if you like, but take a picture wow. of you. So the picture That's you saw. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And so where is it? Where does the document live now? It's in Chicago, the National Archives. That's neat. Well, I'll yeah. definitely have to go like check it out sometime. Be like, I know yeah. how this came to be. How I've got a cool. high quality scan. Um, I'll have, I think I have one blown up like three feet by four feet or something. I'll have to. Yeah, that'd be cool to that. see. It's really neat. Yeah. That is so cool. And, in you know, and obviously you've done so much research and have learned so much over the years that even in this podcast and just other things, when I reach out to people and like, do you know Art? You need to meet Art. Have you ever heard of Art Chavez that a lot of people to me have kind of said that you are like one of like the historians? Yeah, that's pretty common. Time. How does that how does that feel? That's kind of a that's quite the honor. It's humbling, but it is honor an honor too. Um, but it's just a matter of going out, asking questions, knocking on doors, going to museums, and after a while your your reputation develops, especially after you write articles and Give, I give a lot of presentations too, so also oh, that yes. that develops my 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 uh, um, notoriety, so to speak. Yeah, no, I think that's neat. Well, and especially like you know, in Ludington, talking to people, and they're like, "You need to meet this guy from Milwaukee." If you ever get to Milwaukee, I'm like I know Art. Like, <laughs> <laughs> actually, more people know about me in Michigan than in Wisconsin. That's very true. Oh, I, I'm asked to give more presentations on the Michigan side than I am in Wisconsin. Really? Yep. And a lot of times people are surprised that I, I live in Milwaukee or Wisconsin in general. A lot of them think I live in Ludington or Grand, Ra Grand Haven or something or Grand Rapids. Yeah. So oh, how interesting. interesting. I mean, if I had my way, I would live in Michigan because it's closer to a lot of my research and, and, uh, a lot of friends too that I've yeah. uh, worked over the years, but well, we will definitely think of you as an honorary Michigander. There's nothing wrong with oh, that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make you it. We'll make it official. We'll get you a document or something. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my favorite things, like when I started working at the car ferry, was I can't exactly remember who, but someone handed me a book of the Images of America SS Badger book and said read this book. You'll love it. It'll, it'll help you a lot in your job. And, um, and I, you know, I had seen the book around town and such, and I was like, okay. And I looked through it and I have, and I'm not just saying this cause like we're talking now, I know I've told you this before, but it's like, I have gifted your book to so many people and I, I've learned so much about it. Like even before I met you, um, that's almost like 
I feel like when I finally did get to meet, it was almost like I was fangirling a little bit of like, I love this book and you're a real person. And but what a great pictorial timeline, but historical timeline as well, that I feel like it's a really good book that, you know, yeah, you can read about the car fairies, but you have to have that visual sense too, of how they came together and how they're built. Um, so what I think is really cool is that you're working on a second edition that is now live and available. Um, and so when, let's talk about the book a little bit of when did the first edition come out? Uh, that came out in 2003. It seems like yesterday. That's I bet when, it does. It came out for the 50th anniversary of Badger. So did it now actually celebrate the 70. So did you write it in mind of the 50th or was it just kind of a chance that it came it, out at that time? It was kind of chance. But when I did go to the Chicago office at Arcadia Publishing, mm-hmm. um, when I gave my presentation and tried to convince them to publish it, I did use that um, 50th anniversary coming up where it, it yeah. should sell well in the mm-hmm. gift shop, things like that. So, and they did like the idea, obviously. And uh, yeah, well, and I'm not sure how many that we have sold in the gift shop, but it is really cool to see passengers on board flipping through it and reading through it or yeah. saying like, Oh, like, can you tell me more about this? Or, you know, this is clearly on the ship. Like where would that be today? Yep. Well, that's why I did it. And, even though they're pictorial histories and you're kind of limited to what you can write in it. Uh, mm-hmm. I try to get in as much information as I could, like yeah. in a running chronological fashion. So yeah, I'm, and I'm glad excited. I'm glad you said that because I mean, I'm a very visual person, but I love learning and I love, you know, looking at like comparing of like the then versus now and everything, but you have done a really good job of the stories. The pictures tell the story, but the yes. words supplement it in a way that, it's like, like it's taking me back in time, back mm-hmm. to 1953 with all these that, like I said, it's one of my like favorite books. That I, and I have a copy <laughs> in my office that I'll often like flip through it. And then I'll find myself like reading onto the next page. I'm like, oh yeah, why did I pick up this book again? Like, because <laughs> I feel like every time I pick it up, I learn something new because it's how, and so when did you decide that you wanted to create a second edition? Uh, probably a year and a half ago, Ken Ottman, uh, another car ferry friend of mine, uh, good friend for life. Yeah. He suggested mm-hmm. it. He's the one who suggested that I uh, uh, approach Arcadia and, and to see if I can have another one published. So they agreed. And uh, I said, I would like to leave the existing book as is, but because it you really can't change it. That is, that's yeah. history already documented. But you <laughs> also did did your due diligence and make sure that it was done correctly and accurately too. That yeah, there's it's a standalone piece in and yes. of itself. Yes. Um, but the updated version I wanted to include what happened from 2003 to the present day, and a lot has yeah. happened to the ship, to the dock itself, and oh yeah. Ludington and Manitowoc rebuilding it, the destruction of the dock with the storm. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, in even in like the 20 years of because how many pages did that add on the second edition? Wasn't it uh, like 32 pages? So now it's 160 instead of right 128. So, yeah, in 20 years, 32 pages like that's a lot of history to cover. It is. But I also included a lot of the color images when the badger oh, first yes. came out. So that was really mm-hmm. an important part. Yeah. Of the, for of the sure. Network. And so what has been like the best part about creating the second edition? Um, well, meeting you, because I asked a lot <laughs> of you and um just, now, it was like a highlight for me to work on this with you. I I will say. Like it, I do appreciate that. And I, but I truly mean that because like, you know, I have a background in graphic design and like bookmaking. And after like reading this book, you know, pretty much cover mm-hmm. to cover, um, that was neat to like get to help with it. But it was just neat to learn your process and mm-hmm. how you did it all. And thank you. Well, hopefully I'll use your services uh, on other projects <laughs> in the future. Of course. <laughs> you got me. All right, you got me you. for sure. But I just think it's so cool, you know, to think of the 70 years in general of how many pages again, did you say it is now? Not 160. Yeah, 160 that, you know, there's so much to say in just 160 pages that 
easy for me to say you could double, if not triple. Oh, that. I could. You know, right. if they would let me just have a total manuscript book, it could be 300 pages. So absolutely. Oh, I'm sure. Indeed. And um, so what are you looking forward to most about the second edition and people getting getting this copy? Just seeing the color photographs. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. unbelievable to me. I mean, just seeing the color images of the Spartan brand new right out of the yeah. shipyard with a yellow CNO on her stack. I mean, that is just fantastic. For sure. Flags, and flying, yep. I've seen the proof of proofs of it and I cannot wait to see the actual physical copy in my hand and especially the cover photo. I absolutely love. I mean, everything about the book. I'm I'm just fangirling over here. Like <laughs> And oh, you, met the young, you met the young man, Trevor, who took the cover photograph. Yes. And drone was shot. that the first sailing of our 2021 season? Yep. Under uh, Interlake. It was the first yes. eastbound crossing from Manitowoc to Ludington under Interlake Maritime Services. But what kind of a good way to start the book of kind of this new era, exactly. if you will. And I think that pays homage that I noticed these little details, maybe that's mm -hmm. just me, but I think, and you've said it, you know, you do this because you love it. It's not because you're out to make millions, even though I, I think you deserve me, that. Not make millions on our coaching <laughs> books. <laughs> Well, I'll have to give them a call, um, but no, um, it's definitely a labor of love, it is. like from front to back in every single page and most definitely. Yeah. Anybody who publishes uh, Great Lakes shipping books, it's just a labor of love. There's no major money in any of it because you spend so much on research, uh, spending money on fuel, going to hotels and whatever. So, Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's a break-even proposition at best, to be honest with you. Well, and it's something but that's that, not the point we why we do it. It's no, but I think, but I just appreciate you putting this research down in a way that people are able to enjoy it for generations to come. And um, like I said, there was a woman last year that I met on board who it was her first time on the Badger. It was her first time, you know, going across Lake Michigan. And I don't even really know if she was really knew much about Michigan and Wisconsin in general, but she was just super happy to be enjoying her time on the ship, was blown away about everything about it. But she got in your book and she was looking through and she's like, oh my gosh, like I had no idea. She's like, I was just loving the ship how it is today, but I had no idea how much love went into this over the years. And she was saying how she was excited Um to go home and show her kids this book. And she's like, mm -hmm. look at this ship that I got to sail on. And just not every day you get to do that. Yeah, that's nice. That's why I do uh, what I do, because a lot of people get something out of it. They learn something and it just perpetuates the history of the operation. Exactly. And we really appreciate your time and efforts in doing that because it is quite the history that even though I've been doing this job for almost four years, I am still constantly learning things that I had no idea about. I have too. It never ends. It is just so fascinating. And there's been so many things that even you have like, I thought I knew something about the ship. And then you tell me a whole other side of it that I had no idea even existed. And it was really fun, you know, working with you on, I mean, you did most of the work, but talking about the stacks and just like, the different stack logos in the eras that that represented. And you know, I know a lot of that kind of translates to the book, but I guess I, I don't know if I ever asked you, did you have a favorite era of the ship? Hmm, probably the Pierre Marquette era. Um, yeah. Especially the very beginning with uh, William Mercero, who mm -hmm. uh, was the grandfather of the fleet, more or less, who actually developed the operation to what it is was in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. The operation. Yeah, I would say that era, probably 1897 till maybe 1939 or so when the Midland came out. To me, that was the um, ultimate era in car freight development, different ships coming out, advances mm -hmm. in technology. Just fascinating. Very exciting. Yeah. And I, you know, growing up in Ludington, I'm very thankful that I have the Badger, um, but especially like 
my dad is very quick to tell me of like, oh, this is nothing compared to, you know, seeing one, one coming in and one going out that I wish I could have experienced some of that. But it's easy for me to say that, oh, now the era like Mm -hmm. that we're in now is my favorite because I get to experience that. But I just think it's so fascinating that she really has stood the test of time through so many different things. Oh, without a doubt. And and the historian in me is just always like so giddy to like learn more and things (laughs) that I just appreciate that there's historians like like you out there that want to help it keep it alive for the future generations because that's what will make the difference. And I also want to thank um, Glenn Bowden and George Towns of Michigan mm-hmm. Wisconsin Transportation, MWT. Uh, <clears throat> you hear a lot about uh, Mr. Conrad saving the yeah. boat. But without uh, Mr. Bowden and Mr. Towns, LMC wouldn't be in existence today. So, Which I is so true. Them. Yeah, and, and I really appreciate that perspective um, because really, it, yeah, if it wasn't for them, Charles Conrad would have never had the opportunity to buy the ship. And, um, you know, and I've said she's really stood the test of time, but she's had a lot of people along the way that have said, hey, what can we do? What can we as the community, how can we rally around this ship and keep her going? Exactly. And there's been a lot of community involvement in mm-hmm. London and Manitowoc, getting the Badger back in operation in 1991 and 1992 when Mr. Yeah. Conrad took over. So without the help of Ludington and Manitowoc, also their involvement, mm-hmm. the ship wouldn't be in operation today. It took a lot yeah. of lifting from a lot of people. So Yeah, and definitely in both communities for sure. And um it's just so cool to see. And so back to the book really quick, because I know you talked about it a little bit, but do you have any future books or projects in the works? I'm always working on different articles <laughs> and that big all around history of the car ferries, my 30 year joke, but yes, that's. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to like subtitle or like not sub, like sub headline it, like the 30 year joke or something <laughs> now at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and but um, I think but it's yeah. always cool. The articles though. And like, and you talked about a little bit earlier too, of the article about, um, the Seagates. Yeah. And I think that's so fascinating too, because I had no idea that a, was structurally a Seagate, like, oh, it, it makes sense of keeping things in the ship. But what an important role that they do in just it the everyday. It keeps the water off, off the car deck, right? It keeps water yeah. out. Not watertight, but it deflects. The yeah, water. I never would have thought of it that way. And I'm no able no um naval architect by any means but i was just like wow how fascinating to think of to me it seems like it's a simple addition it's something you see all the time i but know there was but a just time think they didn't have one they didn't yeah. it wasn't there when they first came out in 1892 yeah i don't know um, why they were uh in the past couple of years we discovered a drawing of the ann arbor number one the very first carpet and it shows a vertical sliding door that comes down. So it did have a Seagate oh, in design on paper, but it but never, never... Actually, nope, it never came to be. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. It is very interesting. Do you think, and I mean, I'm sure we could probably have a whole discussion just on yeah, that. Yeah, we could. It, but do you think it was like a budget cut or? Absolutely. Just... That's always what it is. Yeah. I interviewed a, a naval architect from the University of Michigan. He's retired now. He mm. was Guy Meadows. He's yeah. expert on all things uh, uh, architecture and marine engineering. And I asked him that very question about 15 years ago. Why is it that these ships do not have Seagates? He said, well, it's like anything else. He says, if it's not mandated by the government and it costs extra money, if you get, get, can get away without having it on the ship, why put it on? Yeah. I mean, valid. That's fair. Yeah. But... As history has proven, three ships sank uh, either with Mm -hmm. a Seagate or a a fairly weakly constructed Seagate. So you actually need the device. Yeah. Well, I think that's one thing that I really respect and honor with the maritime industry is that they learn from their mistakes. And it's very unfortunate that we had the three ships sink, but glad that they took the opportunity to learn from that, too. 
And this happened in modern times, too, with the uh, ferries in the English Channel and in Europe. Uh, in oh, modern wow. times, in the past 25, 30 years, that ferries have sailed with, they have bow doors in a lot of cases. Oh, yes. And yeah. Those bow doors uh, come loose or they didn't uh, properly uh, secure the hatches on deck. Mm -hmm. Whatever the case may be, water came on that deck and capsize the ship i shouldn't be talking about capsizing ships <laughs> when we're talking about lake michigan but, oh but but, but no the, it's a valid point of but how the badger this... is well run it's 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 safe and all precautions have been taken since those disasters oh for sure and i'm you know, I, I will always give our crew the highest regard for making sure everyone's safe and everything. But but this is a good example, though, of why history is important. Yeah. Why right. we need these historical. You learn by your mistakes. That's the cliche, but it's true. It Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. And so, I've been on the car. I've been I've made trips many times when they had lipo drills in the middle of the lake. Yep. Yeah. So they, you got to do it. Yep. You got to do it. So talking about the car ferries, I already know this answer, but I want to get your take on it again. What is your favorite car ferry? Or which one was your favorite car ferry? To be honest, to be honest with you, the first one was a Spartan because I like that was the first boat I rode on. Mm, and yep. The Spartan was not raised like the Badger was. So it was yeah. like in its original form. And when you look at the side of the boat, there's a nice curve by the Seagate. And when you look mm -hmm. at the side profile. The Badgers has kind of like a 45 degree angle when the Seagate arm is in the down. Yeah. So you know I, what? Like, I guess I have, I knew that. I guess I just never thought about it. The I'm going to walk over Seagate. there tomorrow and look at it. <laughs> the Badger Seagate arms are, the hinges are, have been moved to the outside of the ship. So the arms yeah. are, are straight and out, but in the Spartan, the hinges are still inside. And when you look at the back end, it has a nice curve. I call it a swan tail yeah. curve along the back end of the boat. Right. So that, that's kind of why I like the Spartan too. And then I knew uh, Captain Bissell. That was his his first ship. Mm -hmm. that he uh, sailed uh, regularly as a relief. Oh yeah. In the nineteen seventies, and I I met Captain Hines too. There, Jim Hines on the Spartan. Yeah. So, yeah. so it was kind of my favorite then, but after a mm -hmm. while, riding the Midland and learning the history and then seeing how completely different the interior was yeah i fell yeah. in love <laughs> well in so many people and i always love to ask that question because nine times out of ten i know the answer is going to be the city of midland <laughs> right and it's like and i definitely want to keep her legacy alive how i can but then after you just had just sent me some pictures a few weeks ago of the interior like interior mm -hmm. chest that i had never seen and i get it i can mm -hmm. see just like that just seemed like, I mean, I love lounging on the Badger, don't get me wrong, but just the city of Midland just had that class about her. Mm -hmm. um, and remind me again, what year was she built? 1941. And then they That's had a I promenade thought. deck. It was a covered promenade deck. Yes. That went all the way around on the passenger deck. And you could, if it were really hot in the lounge or a lot of people in the lounges on the Midland, you could just go on the deck chair outside and relax. It could be rainy but you'd be fully protected by that overhead. Wow. So that was just unbelievable. That would be such a cool experience. You have so many great memories and things that I'm always so appreciative of you sharing. And I can't help but be a little envious at times too. I can't, can't deny that. Other but, people have told me that too, that they feel kind of envious that they weren't with us back then. But I'm envious too of like John Hausman and Jim Gagorski who did uh, mm -hmm. did what we did in the 1960s and early 70s and they rode seven boats with the cno yeah four ships with the ann arbor and three grand trunk ferries so they saw all of them oh goodness can you so imagine? there you go i, I guess it's just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh i also uh audio recorded a lot of crew members who are now passed on Oh, really? I, I, yep. Yep. I got to get those. Uh, some of them I transcribed already, but I want to either incorporate that into the big book mm -hmm. or uh, maybe just make a, a separate book with just their uh, reminiscence of the car ferries. So I don't know what I'll do, but that's something that also I'd like to 
Wow, that would be yeah, such an clear. amazing addition. It is. It is. It's wow. So, so that's kind of a great segue into my next question. And this might be a broad question, but do you have a favorite memory that involves the car ferries over your many years of sailing? I've got a couple of them. Um, I remember being with Doug Goodhue in Kiwani. Maybe it was 1983 or 19. Doug knows the exact date. I don't, but mm -hmm. um, the Midland was coming in. It must have been 11, 30, 12 at night. Um, real still, calm day, no wind. And we were on the breakwater by the lighthouse. And the Midland was still maybe two or three miles out. And you could actually hear the bow wave roaring. You could hear just oh, a big wow. motion sound. I mean, you might be able to hear that on the Badger now, but there's a lot more traffic in Ludington compared to Kiwani. Mm -hmm. So just, just the hearing that, dark out, and you could barely see it, but you could barely discern the big bow wave. I was going full speed. It was probably going 17 miles an hour. But hearing wow. that roar was just amazing. And then later on, um, we actually took the trip outbound, and you could see the stars reflecting off the water. So what that, a beautiful like setting it was wow. yes and, and on a badger um i was meeting uh doug and ken probably in ludington they were out i think they took the midland perhaps i was on a badger coming from milwaukee i believe this is 1984 we passed through this huge thunderstorm it was an electrical storm oh gosh and, and i know that People who sail on ships see this all the time, or have seen it, but I never have. We were mm. keeping up with the storm, and the lightning bolts were hitting the water all around the ship, and the, it was oh, so wow. blinding. And the, the flashing was constant. It was just the most awe-inspiring thing you'd ever want to see, and I'll never forget that. That and is that, something I would love. I mean, I would love to see the Northern Lights while on the Badger, but I would say that would be like next level, if not like something more I'd love to see is like a lightning electric storm like that. I bet. That oh, would and, be and it, it, the, the thunder was crashing so close and the bolts were so close that the mast was just rattling the ship's, the Badger's mast. Mm -hmm. It was just like wow. shaking. It was just, <laughs> it was the craziest thing you ever want to see, but it was awe-inspiring. Yes. How cool. Mm -hmm. Those two incidents, I'll never forget those. are fantastic. That is yep. so cool. But there have been many others, but those two stand out. <laughs> oh, I know. On, I've been on some heavy storms in the Midland, too. Um, a pretty bad one that um, I actually had to hang on to in the I was riding in a pilot house. Oh, I, wow. actually, I was on a stool and I couldn't um, I couldn't sit there without falling over. So I had to grab onto something. Oh, my goodness. Oh. That much. And carrying rail cars, you think. How are yeah. those cars staying fastened on the deck? <laughs> I know such an art and a science all in one with that. I and mean, yeah. And I, you know, I hear stories and see photos of just like, I don't know how they did it back. And I see, you know, the loads that we carry today and it's amazing, but those loads are nothing compared to the full rail cars. Oh yeah. And they actually broke loose back in the day too. Right. The cars would roll on the deck or they actually come out, come out of the stern of the boat dump six cars into the lake. Yep. Yeah. Not a you know, but it was an Ann Arbor boat. So yeah, but still just wow. Yeah. So with the Badger celebrating 70 years of service in 2023, how does it feel to be a part of that legacy? Very humbling. Um, but uh I do what I can to preserve the history and I continue to do so. So yeah, I'm proud of it. I actually am. Yeah, My I'm friends, too. I'm not the only one who does this. Other oh, for sure. friends of mine do presentations <laughs> and write articles and do their their own niche part of, mm -hmm. the, of the history yeah. of ships. Well, and we so appreciate you, you know, sharing that history and helping keep it alive and making sure that we have an accurate account of you know what to tell our future generations and that we're sharing the right things that we so appreciate all that you've done for us over the years i know we could keep talking about stories and i think we'll probably have a few more episodes in the works here soon but sure, I'm i am so excited to get my copy of the second edition book um and i know we'll have it available on the gift shop that 
we'll get that um, underway here soon for passengers to enjoy. But um, we look forward to keep them selling in the gift shop. Yeah, in closing, um, I just wanted to uh, recognize LMC staffers that really helped me with my research over the years. Because of course. I wouldn't be able to um, know what I know and uh, without the help of Jim Anderson in particular and Chuck Cart. But also um, Charles Conrad, Bob Manglis, while I did not know them, I appreciate their efforts to maintain the ship itself but Kerry Carr I work closely with Tom Hawley Don Klingin and Linda Doherty Matson. all of those people I may not have thanked as often as I should have but I want to publicly thank them all for all they've done for me fielding questions doing favors for me research requests getting meetings set up with like the um Bureau, American Bureau of Shipping in, in uh, Sturgeon Bay. Thanks to Jim Anderson for that. And Chuck Cart for over the years. And I know he probably thought, oh, this guy's bothering me again. <laughs> but he always cheerfully helped me out with whatever research request, whether it was about Seagates, whether it was uh, engineering details, furniture, just answering all kinds of questions. And for sure. Chuck also, um, when the Midland was still there at the dock, he allowed me to acquire one piece of every uh, uh, device used to secure the rail cars. Oh, so I wow. Took, I took them home, cleaned it up, painted them, weighed and measured all these pieces. And I did donate all those to the Wisconsin Maritime Museum many years ago so they've got oh, that's them. wonderful yep. good for you so. yeah the badger has definitely had um, an amazing crew over the years that have really honored their tradition of what she's done but it's people like you that you know bring them together and just keep that history alive that we appreciate your efforts as well of helping keep her history alive thank you thank you appreciate of course that. so thank you and we will have you on an episode again soon i'm sure mm-hmm <laughs> And now a word about our partners in our port cities. If your idea of the perfect vacation is sugar sand beaches, clear blue waters along 28 miles of Lake Michigan shoreline, outdoor adventures, climbing to the top of historic lighthouses, or exploring a charming downtown, Ludington is your destination for pure Michigan fun. Ludington's unspoiled natural resources offer the quintessential up north experience, all within easy reach, located at the intersection of US 31 and US 10. No matter what you're seeking, a beach or outdoor adventure, a peaceful getaway, or just a community of friendly faces. You can find it all in Pure Ludington. As a Ludington native, I know I sound biased, but Ludington is truly an astonishing place. There's always something going on, amazing places to dine and get drinks, along with unique attractions you won't find just anywhere. Plan your visit today at pureludington.com. Manitowoc. The maritime capital of Wisconsin is the perfect vacation destination for those seeking adventure, a little relaxation, or a whole lot of fun. With sandy beaches, miles of biking and hiking trails, a real World War II submarine that you can both climb aboard and sleep on, a strong art scene, variety of breweries to explore, and array of annual events and festivals, Manitowoc offers so many unique and exciting options for visitors to add to their travel itinerary. As a frequent visitor to Manitowoc, I can attest to the thriving and charming downtown. From classic candy and ice cream parlors to outdoor music venues, there's so much to explore, experience, and enjoy in Manitowoc. I always look forward to going back. Start planning your getaway to Manitowoc, Wisconsin at visitmanitowoc.com.